This is the SFF Audio Podcast. I'm Scott. I'm Jesse. How's it going? All right. Not bad. How how about with you? Uh, Things are good. Things are good. Hanging in there. Hey, this week we've got a bunch of recent arrivals or new arrivals, things that have come in. So let's talk about those today. All right. All right. Okay, first, uh, uh, Epic Fantasy. I think we spoke about this before, but uh, um, it's called The Rune Lords. Mm -hmm. Book one, Some of All Men by David Farland, who's a a local author to me. He lives down in uh, St. George, Utah. Mm -hmm. Um, 22 Hours, 17 Discs. This is from uh, Blackstone Audio, read by a fellow named Ray Porter. Don't know him. Don't, yeah, I don't, I don't recognize his name either. Um, says here he's been on Frasier and ER and Will and Grace and The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is a show I'm very familiar with. Really? Mm-hmm. I've never even heard of it. It's a Disney Channel kids show ah. that uh, my kids are both fans of. Well, you maybe you'll recognize them when you... <laughs> maybe I will. Yep. <clears throat> Um, he's written several volumes in the Rune Lord series. I don't know how many there are right now. Um, let me just read some of this on the back. It says, David Farland's acclaimed Rune Lord series introduces a world where the social structure is based upon the magical exchange of endowments, such as stamina, grace, and wit. The Rune Lords are those who receive these endowments from their vassals, becoming superhuman in exchange for the responsibility of caring for those they have deprived of strength or beauty or sight. Young Prince Gayborn of Mysteria is traveling to disgu- in disguise on a journey to ask for the hand of the lovely Princess Iomi of Silvarest- Silveresta. <laughs> Armed with his gifts of strength and perception, the prince and his bodyguards stop at a local tavern where they spot a pair of assassins who have their who have their sights set on Princess Iomi's father. As they race to warn the king, they realize that more than the royal family is at risk. The very fate of the earth is in jeopardy. Well, that's that. Um, I was just looking it up. We did talk mm-hmm. about we talked about it in episode eight, and this is the one you were telling me um, where people go around branding other people. Yeah, right. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds yep. pretty good. It, yeah, it's, I've read it in print, and it's a, it's a very good book. The first one in the series, you say? Yes, it is. Uh-huh. Okay. Good place yep. to start, then. Um, yeah, The Sum of All Men, I think, is a subtitle that was added later, but uh, when I bought it originally, it just said The Rune Lords on it. Okay. And then I think they decided to call the series The Rune Lords, so the subtitle is The Sum of All Men. Sounds good. All right, next one from Brilliance Audio, um, Dragonheart by Todd McCaffrey, mm-hmm. uh, one of the Dragon Riders of Pern books. Uh, Todd McCaffrey, it looks like, has um, taken over now from Anne McCaffrey. There was a, a number of books that had both their names on it, you know, by Anne McCaffrey and Todd McCaffrey, but now this one's just by Todd. But it does say Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Riders of Pern mm-hmm. on the top. So Dragonheart is a name, though, that I mean that was a film, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I think I, I'm right. sure it's not. It's not the same story. I'm not saying that. No. But, um, Dragonheart is a is a title we've heard before. I think you're right. Um, read by Emily Durante. Um, Looks like it's a sequel. It says, uh, "Oh, author of Dragon's Blood." Is this a sure. series of? Uh, well, obviously, Dragon series from Anne McCaffrey, but yeah, is this a Pern book? It is, yeah. Dragon Riders of Pern, Dragonheart. Alrighty. Um, yeah, this means you read part of this. Sure. Um, the grim, the grim specter of sickness looms over the wires of Pern, felling fire lizards and posing a potentially devastating threat to their dragon cousins. Pern's sole defense against the deadly phenomenon that is Thread. Fiona, the youngest and only surviving daughter of Lord Bemin, is just coming of age, and about to assume the duties of Wire Woman. When word spreads that dragons have indeed become, begun succumbing to the new contagion. 
you're calling it a wear. I think I think it's uh, wire. I think it's supposed to be wear. You think it's wire? Wear, wear. Yeah. wear. Uh-huh. That's one of those I've always uh, pronounced that way. Yeah. Wire. I don't yeah. think it's wire. I think it's wear. Uh-huh. I don't know why. Yeah, I am a. I used to be, I guess, a fan of uh, the Dragon Riders books. I don't know why I got away from them because they are all really good. Every one I've ever read. Um, now are they? But I read, you know, the, the first trilogy and. Uh, What's that? Are they fantasy or science fiction? I would say they're science fiction. <laughs> you know why? Uh, because of the uh, explanation of why the dragons exist. Okay. Because they're um, genetically engineered. They were... Uh, um, the Pern people are colonists from another planet. I yeah. can't remember if it said they were from Earth or whatever. But the dragons were invented to take care of as a, as a good way to take care of the thread which falls and destroys things everything it touches mm -hmm. so they were genetically engineered by scientists well definitely then science fiction yeah because they're you know science scientists that's right. scientists man that's right <laughs> all right now from penguin audio have you heard of jim butcher yeah, yeah. Yeah, he wrote, I mean, he's famous for the Dresden Files, right? Mm -hmm. He's, um, you know, which is uh, Buzz, buzzy somewhat media. Buffy, Buffy-like universe, as I understand it. it it's, uh, you know, the, the Dresden Files. Are you familiar with those? Yeah, it's a TV show and, um, sure, the books, yeah. Okay. Anyway, he's written an epic fantasy series that I was not aware of until I got these in. Mm. Um, they sent us four volumes wow. of... Yeah, the first book, it's called, the, the series is called The Codex Alera, A-L-E-R-A. Uh-huh. Um, the first book is called Furies of Calderon. And um, I've got Wikipedia up here in front of me, mm -hmm. and um, it summarizes the series, so let me read that. Codex Alera is a fantasy book series by Jim Butcher. The six books in the series chronicle the life of a young man named Tavi in the Empire of Alera on the world of Karna. Every Alaran of every rank and station except for Tavi has some degree of command over elemental forces or spirits called Furies. The story takes place after the rise of a fictional empire similar to Rome, where the first lord must stave off infighting amongst the nobility of a now decadent empire and hold the throne through sheer force of strength and will. Tavi, ta trapped by fate in the midst of conflicts at home and abroad, must use all of his intelligence to save Alara. Hmm. So, is this an older series? Art. Does it say when this it came? It says um, on on Jim Butcher's site, it, it was uh, two thousand. Yeah, they're they're not ancient. No, but they're uh, pre they predate October 5th, his October fifth, two thousand four, where the first one was released. Yeah, so it predates his um his uh, new newer series, I guess, the Dresden Files. Does it? Um, two thousand four. I think so. Only four years ago. Okay. I think it does. I could be wrong. Okay, or maybe it's contemporary with. Um, so Buzzy Multimedia yeah. has um, all the Dresden file books. Okay. Um, and I guess Penguin's got this. Yeah, Penguin's got uh, this epic fantasy series. And, I haven't seen uh, anything it, from Penguin in a while, so that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, well, they're the ones who sent us the little book, which I am listening to right, right now. Right, right. Um, yeah. And they uh, it's read by Kate Redding, who is fantastic. She reads... Uh, some of Robert Jordan's stuff as well. That's how we know him in this house anyway. Isn't she deceased? No, her, I mean. Kate Redding, I don't think so. Uh, okay. No. Um, who, who am I thinking is was, deceased? I think it was... Uh, oh, I know, I know. I know who you mean, but gosh, I can't remember her name. It's uh, She was a Blackstone... Um, yeah, maybe a friend of Kate's. Um, could be. Oh, jeez. Blackstone Audio... I know who you're talking about. Yeah. But no, I don't believe it was her. Hmm. Okay. Well, if she's okay, not dead, so sorry about that, Kate. <laughs> Still not dead. We're not um, dead yet! <laughs> <laughs> not quite dead. There we okay. go. Okay. Um, all right, so the first uh, volume is called Furies of Calderon. And then um, book two is called Academ's Fury. 
book three is called Cursor's Fury. And then, uh, for some reason, they didn't send book four. But book five is Princeps Fury, and that's one that just came out. Um, that no is a book new release. four. Then we, you don't need to read that one. <laughs> <laughs> book four is called Captain's Fury. So um, I'm sure if they probably we start, just didn't have any stock. It looks like my wife has started to listen to this first one. So oh, good. She's uh, she likes the epic fantasy, which is cool. Yeah, that is good. Okay, um, Random House. I've got three titles from Random House. You did get a lot. Yeah. The first one is called The Widows of Eastwick by John Updike. Also read by Kate Redding. That's an old so, one. No, this is brand new. Oh. The uh, The Witches of Eastwick is the one you're probably thinking about. Yeah, the Widows, I guess it was. The Widows of Eastwick is a sequel, so it's a brand new sequel by John Updike. Wow. Pulitzer Prize winner. Yep. Yeah, Pulitzer Prize, National Book Award, American Book Award, National Books Critics Circle Award, Rosenthal Award, and Howell's Medal. Those are awards that John Updike has won. Not for this novel. Right. Um, but anyway, I'm actually looking forward to it. Let me read just a little bit of the back. Mm -hmm. uh, more than three decades have passed since the events described in John Updike's The Witches of Eastwick. The three divorcees, Alexandra, Jane, and Suki, have left town, remarried, and become widows. They cope with their grief and solitude as widows do. They travel the world and renew old acquaintance. Why not go back to Eastwick for the summer? The old Rhode Island seaside town, where they indulged in wicked mischief under the influence of the diabolical Daryl Van Horn, is still magical for them. Now Daryl is gone, and their lovers of time have aged or died, but enchantment remains in the familiar streets and scenery of the village. And among the local citizenry, there are still those who remember them and wish them ill. How they cope with the lingering traces of their evil deeds, the shocks of a mysterious counterspell, and the advancing inroads of old age form the burden of Updike's delightful, ominous sequel. <laughs> I, um, I, I like how that incorporated some advertising at the beginning for advertising for the own book. Why not spend, mm -hmm. the, spend the summer with some witches? <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah. Yep, good stuff. Did you read the original? Um, no, no movie though. I've read a couple of John Updike novels. One of them was called Roger's Version, which is kind of science fiction as well. Oh uh, no, it's not a... science fiction when he does it though. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. It was about. Um... Gosh, I, I I just barely remember it. It was about uh, a computer programmer who created a world. Or something like that. Okay. So, like, um, um, my and then um, I read the first, something. the first rabbit novel. He's written. I think he won the Pulitzer Prize for his rabbit novels. Yeah, I've read a lot about those, but I haven't read that. I read them. Yeah, I read the first one. All right, very exciting release here. Um, Poe's Children, as in Edgar Allan Poe. Mm -hmm. That's how they spell it. It's a new horror anthology by Peter Straub, edited by Peter Straub. That should be great. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. They've uh, Some of the narrators, Mark Bramhall, Cassandra Campbell, Mark Deakins, Dominic Hoffman, L Lincoln Hopp, Anne-Marie Lee, John Lee, Don Leslie, Rebecca Lohman, and Donna Rollins. I know uh, Mark Bramhall we've heard before and John Lee we've heard before, and um, they're really excellent narrators. Um, Who are some of the authors? Okay, here we go. In fact, I'll read you the whole table of contents. Okay. <clears throat> um, the first story is called The Bees by Don Chown, C-H-A-O-N. Next one is Cleopatra Brimstone by Elizabeth Hand. Mm -hmm. And then The Man on the Ceiling by Steve Rasnick and Melanie Tem. Body by Brian Evanson. Louise's Ghost by Kelly Link. Mm. Lita by M. Rickert. The Two Sams by Glenn Hirschberg. Notes on the Writing of Horror, a Story by Thomas Ligotti. Le Go ahead. No, I was Le just thinking uh, uh, the titles are all take uh, are all sort of spin-offs of, uh, if not directly from Poe stories, they're related to particular styles of Poe writing. Keep going. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Little Red's Tango by Peter Straub. The Ballad of the Flexible Bullet by Stephen King. 
Missa Longhi, 1824, by John Crowley. And Insect Dreams, by Rosalind Palermo Stevenson. It's, it's not a huge anthology, but uh, no, there's it's, some great uh, names in there. Yeah, 15 hours long, 12 discs. Holy cow! Yeah. That's, that's so lengthy. I'm very much looking forward to this one. That sounds great. Yeah, they don't do this enough. <laughs> well, you know, um, glad somebody's doing it. And Peter Straub, yeah. I haven't I haven't read anything from him in a while, but uh, he he writes real good. Yes, he does. Real scary. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you know that that's one I need to listen to. I actually have the Talisman by Stephen King and Peter Straub hmm. on audio. It's a giant bunch of CDs. But I have not read that book, and um, I need to get to it. I think I found it on eBay. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, uh, another one from Random House Audio is Star Wars Millennium Falcon by James Luceno. Or, yeah, I think that's how you pronounce it. L-U-C-E-N-O. A mm -hmm. um, couple interesting things to note. First thing is it's read by Mark Thompson. Um, Jonathan Davis has read uh, Star Wars novels, almost every single one of them, for several years now. At least, at least three. <laughs> um, they seem to get a narrator, and then they kind of stick with him or her for a while. Um, so this uh, signifies a change in narrator to a fellow named Mark Thompson. Mm -hmm. And then it is unabridged, wow. which is also Great. new. Again, um, we've talked about this before. If you look at the the history of the Star Wars audiobooks, you're looking at the history of uh, the modern audiobook publishing world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they started with uh, two cassette abridgments, and then um, they changed uh, to uh, CD only, mm -hmm. and then they uh, extended their abridgments in length, and now they are doing nothing but unabridged. And that's great. Yeah. So what's the uh, what's the plot of Millennium Falcon? I, I well, hope it's I'm gonna, they, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna read one it or something. <laughs> I'm gonna read this paragraph with a warning, okay? Because the Star Wars novels are a continuing story. Um, you know, they claim to keep a pretty tight grip on it, and uh, it's all supposed to make sense together, etc. But what that means is this is book like you know. Um, 30 or something. I, I have no idea how many Star Wars novels there are. So, as I start to read this, there's spoilers for stuff that came before. So, okay. if you don't want to hear it, then uh, uh, fast forward now. <laughs> but here we go. Two years have passed since Jason Solo, seduced by the dark side and reanointed as the brutal Sith Lord of Darth Cadus, died at the hands of his twin sister, Jaina, Sword of the Jedi. See, that's a little spoiler rich, isn't it? Boy, I didn't know Jason Solo <laughs> existed, so... Oh, for a grieving Han and Leia, the shadow of their son's tragic downfall still looms large. But Jason's own bright and loving daughter, Alana, offers a ray of hope for the future as she thrives in her grandparents' care. And when the eager, inquisitive girl, in whom the Force grows even stronger, makes a curious discovery aboard her grandfather's beloved spacecraft, the much overhauled but ever dependable Millennium Falcon, the Solo family finds itself at a new turning point. Together, they must set out on an odyssey into uncertain territory, untold adventure, and unexpected rewards. I'm going to guess that so, Ben Kenobi left a note in the bathroom <laughs> when, when uh, he was on board. Well, I, I think they've done a really good job with these Star Wars novels. I've, I've read several of them, um, but Jason Solo and Jaina are the, the son and daughter of Han and Leia, mm -hmm. and now it looks like they've got a granddaughter named Alana. So... Um, it's it's kind of neat how they've done it, you know. I, I can't possibly read all the ones that come out, um, but every no, now and then it's, I it's pick a one whole, up and uh, listen. It's a whole tradition. You have to sort of only only do Star Wars books, but yeah. uh, that's pretty yeah. good. Uh, unabridged. It's pretty neat. Yep, unabridged. Glad to see it. That's good news. All right, then I have a stack here from Macmillan Audio. Yum yum. Yeah, um, they sent us book eight of the Wheel of Time. The Path of Daggers by Robert Jordan. Now, there's 11 volumes out right now. Wow. And Brandon Sanderson, who we talked about who wrote Elantris, is going to write the final volume. In fact, he's doing that now. Mm -hmm. 
Um, oh, and he's on the latest tour podcast, by the way. Yeah. So um, I can read a little bit of this real quick. Sure. Uh, with the... Sh- boy... S E A N C H A N. How would you pronounce that? S- Sinchen, Sinchen Invasion Force, in possession of Ebo Dar. Wow, I can't pronounce these names. <laughs> That's what the narrator's job is. I need to listen is. to learn how to pronounce them. Um, my wife Trish. Every time a uh, Jordan comes in, she listens to it. Um, by the way, it's read by Michael Kramer and Kate Redding. So there's another one by right. Kate Redding. Right. I think. Okay, yeah. maybe they're married. I can't. I, I can't remember. Anyways, Michael Kramer. Um, Michael Kramer. I used to. I used to love his narration of um, uh, the Richard Stark novels from uh, Books on Tape. Mm-hmm. Um, he had this awesome, awesome, like growly voice. And then uh, when he changes to another book, it's like, what? This is the same guy? Oh, where's that voice? Um, <laughs> and so he like he drops it for for more comedic novels and stuff, but. Maybe he uh-huh. gets to put it in uh, in some of these scary, uh, you know, sort of grizzled characters. Right. Huh. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was going to read some of this, but I can't pronounce their names. <laughs> anyway, epic fantasy. I, I just butcher this whole thing. I mean, there, there's names throughout. So. Um, oh, hey, how cool is this? I don't know. <laughs> audio file says of these accomplished readers solid solid performances by Kate Redding and Michael Kramer add a new dimension to the story especially in the way these veteran narrators breathe life into the inner thoughts of the many major players guess who wrote that uh you me <laughs> how funny really yeah it really did uh which was that for us or was that for um no it was audio file okay yeah I don't remember which novel it was for uh, one I've, of, I've, one heard, of I've, I've personally series. heard maybe three of these. One of those three. Um, <laughs> one of the three, yeah. Great. How cool. That's neat. Yeah. All right. Heretics of Dune by Frank Herbert. Read by, can you guess? Um, Scott Breck. Yes. In fact, I'm looking for who read it. It's not on here. <laughs> You're not sure? You're just guessing? Yeah, I'm guessing, but... There it is. Ah, Simon Vance, Scott Brick, and Catherine Kelgren. So it's not a... Oh, it's a um, multi, multi-reader. Yeah, it's a multi, multiple reader. Yep. So this is the fifth installment in Frank Herbert's classic science fiction series. On Arrakis, now called Rackus, known to legend as Dune, ten times ten centuries have passed. The planet is becoming desert again. The lost ones are returning home from the far reaches of space. The great sandworms are dying, and the Bene Gesserit and the Bene Tliax struggle to f- direct the future of Dune. <laughs> What's that? Bene Tliax. It's T-L-E-I-L-A-X? Tliax. I don't know. Tliax. Okay. I don't know. I'm going from the movie pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> the children of Dune's children awaken as from a dream, wielding the new power of heresy called love. I just watched, uh, rewatched the original... Um, uh, I guess it's not the David Lynch movie; it's the uh, Alan Smithy version. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I don't care what anybody says; the greatest science fiction film ever done. Yeah, awesome, pure awesomeness. Cool. Um, and I like it mostly because it's so literary. It's it's like they they're doing people's thoughts. It's it it uh-huh. fully realizes the 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 novel adds a couple of things to make it more visual. Um, but I so I can't maybe, imagine a better. Maybe person. I have absolutely no clue what you're talking about. I mean, you, this is not the David Lynch version of the movie. Well, uh, the David Lynch version of the movie is the one that came out in the theaters. Um, okay. The Alan Smithy version. Alan Smithy is uh, what happens when you take off the director's name. They put oh, a new yeah. name on there, and the name is oh. Alan Smithy. Um, and the reason ah. they did that is because he dis he doesn't want to be involved with. Um, having every scrap of footage he filmed put into the movie. Um, oh, okay. And so instead of being two hours, 20 minutes, it's like three hours long. Um, I see. And so there's lots of sequences that are slightly incomplete. So like um, in scenes where they should have blue within blue eyes, they they just don't have any uh, 
any eye color effect, right? Hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Or um, at the beginning, there's uh, and a few other spots. There's um, there's uses usage of full color um, illustration rather than um, uh, visual effects. Uh, ah. So you see pictures, uh, you know, drawings of what um, what's going on on other planets. Oh, neat. Yeah. Well, I need to watch that then, because I I've always liked it. Oh, it's awesome. Um, but pure, I've never awesome. watched a, I've never watched an extended version of it. Oh, um, you'll love it. I remember listening to uh, you know Walden tapes put out an interview. Yeah. Um, with David Lynch and Frank Herbert, and Frank Herbert was very pleased with it. Well, I I don't I I don't know what everybody's problem is with this movie other than mm-hmm. the fact that they're they're stupid. I think everybody you know, and, who doesn't like and this movie Sting's in it for stupid. heaven's sake. You know, how could it be a bad movie with Sting? Sting's in it? fine. He's fine. Sting's in it. fabulous. Yeah. He's uh, my, he's my uh favorite musician. There you go. Yep. He's he's my uh my favorite Harkonnen. <laughs> 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 All right. Although okay. that that um that other guy is pretty good too, the bear. <laughs> you bet. Guess what came in? What? It's giant. It's huge. Uh, um, Anathem by Neil Stevenson. Oh yeah. From Macmillan Audio. Don't break your desk when you put it down on it. <laughs> Twenty-eight CDs. Um, let's see. Read by William Dufries. Oliver Wyman, Tavia Gilbert, and Neil Stevenson. So have to yeah, take turns, it's so, it's so they, they lose their breath going through it. <laughs> Heck yeah! In fact, I wrote uh, Dufries, and I said, I just, uh, I just noticed that you read this thing. It must have been a marathon. And he said, Oh yeah. No kidding, hey. And if if no they're kidding. doing, if they're all in the studio recording together, man, that'd be one marathon session. <laughs> that uh, would be something. The director is like, Okay, uh, see you next week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I doubt that they do these together. We get some craft services and yeah, wow. That's but wow, I'm I'm hardcore. really looking forward to this, and we we've talked about it uh, a few times. So um, I thought you started well, listening not to gonna... it. No, I didn't. Oh, oh, I I listened to I was listening to it one day. We were probably skyping each other, but I need to finish uh, little book first, and then I'll get to this one. Okay. Um. But so I'm not officially into it, but yeah, I was listening to it to see what it was like. Well, I'm listening to uh, uh, another Scott Brick. Um, um, d- m- this is not Scott Brick, but I started listening to that Book of Lies by uh, uh, Brad Meltzer. Oh yeah, uh-huh. yeah. So so pretty good so far. We'll see. Oh good. We'll see. I'm, it's it's so um, it's so strange. I, I don't know where it's going. Things like uh, things keep surprising me. So um, I'm hoping that I'm going to keep getting surprised and, and be happy with all the surprises because uh, mm. it's it's not like anything I've read in a long time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Neat. Mm-hmm. Neat, neat, neat. And then something else came in which is near and dear to my heart because I'm a big fan. Ace Banker. En- Ender in Exile by Orson Scott Card. Now, this was a book I did not expect. Um, this one kind of caught me by surprise. Um Okay, first of all, it's a, a multi-reader in, you know, the way that uh, they've done most of the Ender novels. They kind of trade off with the point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's read by David Burney, Cassandra Campbell, Emily Janice Card, Orson Scott Card, Gabrielle DeCure, Kirby Hayborn, Don Leslie, Stefan Rudnicki, and Miran Willis. So... Um, I collection. I now, knew about this a uh, little while ago. Um, yeah, but I, I'm just saying it, it took me by surprise because uh, I I thought that he was going to write two more Ender novels uh-huh. that were going to take place after the ones that have been written, and then he was going to write one novel that uh, brings the two threads back together. Because so he's got a line of shadow novels which are about Bean. Right. And then he's got a line of Ender novels, which are about Ender. Mm-hmm. And then he was going to write... Uh, that's what I understood, anyway. Well, maybe he... he Let me see if I get, I'll, I'll see if I can get clarification. Um, but this one takes place between the last and penultimate chapter <laughs> of Ender's Game. It takes okay. place right in between those two. Okay. Um, 
So at the close of Ender's game, Andrew Wigan, called Ender by everyone, knows that he cannot live on Earth. He has become far more than just a boy who won a game. He is the savior of the Earth, a hero, a military genius, whose allegiance is sought by every nation of the newly shattered Earth hege hegemony. He is offered the choice of living under the hegemon's control, a pawn in his brother Peter's political games, or he can join the colony ships and go out and settle one of the new worlds won in the war. The story of those years on the colony worlds has never been told until now. <laughs> That's it. So Ender's still, you know, 12 years old, I guess. <laughs> uh, in this That's one, one long year for that boy. <laughs> that was a rough time. Yeah. But, of course, I'm really looking forward to it. I love those books. Yeah, he's a good writer. <clears throat> yep. So, what's that about... Uh, Oh, I was just saying, um, like, I uh, think I've got the, the Ender's, Ender's Game comic book came out recently, and uh, Marvel oh. Comics did a, a podcast with uh, Orson Scott Card, and he talked about the next book coming out, and it was the one you just got. Oh, neat. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did listen to that interview. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's neat. So uh, he was talking about the, the the comic book being a um, a like a blueprint for a movie. Yeah, I, I, I heard that. That was interesting. Um, but he also said that the comic book was going to be very, very long. Yeah. Uh, it was, it's actually it was like not that in long, there. but it's, a, it's, nope. it's only five issues. But, uh, but Oh, in, I, I thought he, he must have meant that... Um, in, in terms of... I mean, of, they're going to tell a complete story in five issues? Well, I think it's possible. I mean, it's a lot I better than Star Wars in one issue, you know? Lots and lots and lots of issues. Well, I thought that he was I think saying that been done um, in 10 hey, or 20. everything's in there. Mm -hmm. Depends. It depends. Like uh, a lot of the sequences can be summed up in one panel, you know. Sure. And um, comic book storytelling is, you know, just like in movie storytelling, a montage. Uh huh. You just solve it with a montage. Right. Okay. It reminds me of the song from uh, from the. Uh, uh, what's that movie where Kim Jong Il is a puppet? Uh -huh. <laughs> I can't remember. There's a there's a South Park movie Team, or something. Team no. America? Yeah, Team America. That's it. Uh, I have not seen that. Oh, it's funny. It's funny stuff. <laughs> um, there, there's a musical sequence where uh, all the superheroes are getting ready for action, and it says, "We're gonna do it with a montage." <laughs> they keep, they do <laughs> montage of them getting ready. <laughs> That's good. All right, I've only got Any more? one more. One more title. Okay. Um, it's called uh, the Shakespeare. I'm sorry, not Shakespeare. <laughs> I don't have it in front of me here. Hold on just a second. It's the Sherlock Holmes Theater. Ah. Um, it's that's... done by Yuri Rizovsky. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, William Gillette, and Yuri Rozovsky, read by a full cast. So it's uh, audio drama, mm -hmm. uh, five CDs long with, um, I think, three stories in it. One's just called uh, um, Sherlock Holmes, which is written by Arthur Conan Doyle. And then Arthur Conan Doyle's The Speckled Band. Mm -hmm. And then Yuri Rozovsky wrote Ghastly Murder in Fame Detective's Flat. Oh, so. that sounds like a great idea. Uh-huh. You know, so. um, somebody murdered someone in, in 221B Baker, Baker Street? That's a great idea. Cool. Yep, so I'm looking forward to that. And it's uh, audio drama. Oh, that's going to be good. That's going to be good. And Yuri Rozovsky is one of the fellows, of course, who did... The uh, Beyond 2000, 2000 X mm -hmm. series with Harlan Ellison, mm -hmm. which has some of the best audio drama ever in it. Yep. So, Talented uh, guy. Yeah. I highly recommend Repent Harlequin, said the TikTok man. Stars Robin Williams and Harlan Ellison and Stefan Rudnicki's in it. And you can get it from audible.com, mm -hmm. but the, the negative part about that is it's not in stereo when you get it that way. But right now, there is no other way to get it other than finding yourself a copy on eBay or something. Because Getting that uh, time machine, go listen to it on the radio. Yeah, it was on NPR. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
But yeah, you can get it from audio or Audible. Um, didn't you didn't you have a couple more uh, Mercedes Lackey's Foundation? Oh, didn't we talk about that last no, week? No, I don't think so. We, did. we didn't talk about okay. anything last week. We had uh, uh, interview. Okay. All right, I I thought we had talked about those. Okay, yeah, I've got two more um, fantasies then from um, Brilliance Audio. Oh, one of them Foundation by Mercedes Lackey. Got that right here. And see, I thought I remembered saying, uh, you know, that's a famous title. Didn't they know that? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, that might, might be maybe two weeks ago. It wasn't maybe last so. week. Last week yeah, we it could have been. It could have been. But anyway, we'll talk about it again. Sure. Um, it's, a, it's a fantasy. Mercedes Lackey writes. Uh, she's very prolific. I've seen her on the shelves. I've never read anything by her. Um, but this is a uh, you know short as epic fantasies go. It's uh, ten hours long. Read by Nick Podell. Um, I'll read the paragraph of the description. Mags had been working at Peter's mine, slaving in the dark, cold seams, looking for sparklies for as long as he could remember. The children who worked the mine were orphans, kids who had been abandoned, who had lost their parents, or were generally unwanted. But Mags was different. Mags was bad blood because his parents were bandits who had been killed in a raid by the Royal Guard. Bad blood because he'd been found in a cradle in the bandits' camp. Blood so bad that no one had wanted to take him in except Cole Peters. When he was big enough to see over the sides of the sluices, he had gone to work at the mine. Mags knew nothing of the world beyond the mine and was unaware of how unusual his paltry existence was. Then some strangers on huge white horses forced their way past the Peters family, and carried him away to Haven to become a Herald trainee. Sounds good. Yeah. And then, Wizard's First Rule by Terry Goodkind. Yeah, see, I think we did talk about this, because um, remember there, there's a TV show associated with this. Yeah, we talked about the, the, the book, absolutely. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that was on podcast. Oh, okay. Um, well, Wizard's First Rule by Terry Goodkind. This is an audiobook that has been out for a very long time, um, but it's been re-released because it's got a new cover and it's a TV tie-in. Right. There's a new television series called Legend of the Seeker, which I believe has started. Yeah, I saw somebody um, on SF Signal was bitching about how uh, you can get it on iTunes. You have to, you have to, you can either watch it on uh, syndicated television or get it on iTunes, but you get it on iTunes, it's not free, and it's expensive, mm. and they're basically co making a big complaint about uh, the format, I think. Huh. All right. How, how are they, how are they going to enjoy the series if, 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 if they have to pay money for the first one? Yeah, they ought to uh, give you a sample, at least. Well, and I, I've seen iTunes would... do that before. Yeah, you know, they, they often obviously do. Obviously, there's a deal the there, but they'll, they'll give you the first episode free. Yeah, get, get I've seen the them do that. Yeah, I, I, it makes sense to me. But it's two bucks an episode, usually, on iTunes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's I, not terrible. I, I don't see that being a problem, as long as, you know, you can find a sample somewhere else. Mm-hmm. So, um, Trish is going to review this, my wife. She's finished listening to it and really liked it. Oh, but already it, finished it, listening to it? Yeah, uh-huh. Was it its first rule? Wow. Wizard's First Rule, yeah. Hmm. So we, we've had that in for... Only seven weeks, CDs, so. okay. <laughs> no, no, that's no, doable. This is, <laughs> no, days. this is uh, 28 CDs. Do I have that wrong on the Wizard's page? First Rule, oh my gosh, I do. seven CDs. I also... I have made an error. The publisher was wrong, so I fixed that. Yeah, it's not seven CDs, it's Check 28. Check the ISBN as well while you're there. Okay, it's 28 CDs, 35 okay. hours long. Yeah. 35 short hours... What about the Mercedes Lackey one? Is that correct? Nine CDs? The Mercedes Lackey one is nine discs. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Uh, ten hours long. All right. It's unusually short for a fantasy novel. Right, right. Okay, whoops. I need to be more careful. <laughs> it's not... No right. damage done. <laughs> Somebody says, seven CDs has, on a bridge? He has what? been sacked. They're talking fast. <laughs> He's been sacked. All right, and that is all of our new arrivals. And Wait a bunch, second, though, huh? we, we didn't talk about the Halloween tree. We didn't talk about that before either. I think we did. <laughs> I'm wrong. I think I, I think, think we did. I think we did. I think we talked about that ships of Earth and Valis. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I also wanted to make a make a point. Um, we haven't received it in yet, but um, Guest Law from John C. Written by John C. Wright uh, is mm. out from Infinivox. Came out in late October. Um, oh, neat. Yeah, that one. It's going to be guaranteed good listen because uh, it's from Infinivox. It yes, says, it uh, <laughs> there be pirates in the vast void of space. Does not the poet say, beware of the strangeness of the stranger. Unknown things bring unknown danger. The noble ship Procrustes was silent as a ghost. Warships can be silent if they are slow. Only their missiles need speed. And so it was silent, slowly. That was uh, that the Pro Procrustes approached the stranger's cold vessel. So... First contact uh, in in the grand tradition and uh, going to be guaranteed good listen. 52 minutes, one CD. Great. Yeah, Tom Deere. So yes, narrator. very, very much looking. Yeah, I like him as a narrator, yep, too. he's good. Yep. Fantastic. It is indeed. All right. I got um, a couple things uh, on the go. going to be writing reviews for... Um, uh, Shadow Kingdoms, which is a long mm -hmm. time in uh, listening. Um, it's a, a collection of Robert E. Howard stories, and uh, oh, really from audio realms. Yeah, a really diverse. Um, we've got basically every kind of uh, Robert E. Howard fiction, at least fantasy fiction, and um, definitely some awesome stuff in there. So I'll, I'll write that up, and then maybe we can talk about it next week. Okay. Start playing Fallout Three. Fallout Three. Yeah. Nice stuff, huh? Oh, so addictive. So addictive. <laughs> uh, I, I, I installed it. Went to work while it was installing. When I got home, I started playing it, and mm -hmm. I played until six a.m. <laughs> All oh night. Gosh. All <laughs> night. <laughs> Oh, it's so well, addictive, neat. man. It's really I'm fun. so far behind on the games. Um, you know, we got an Xbox 360, so I've been playing some Halo 3. You can get Fallout for uh, Xbox. Yeah, so I need to try that out. Um, it's. So I've been really fun. impressed. I'm playing Half-Life 2 right now. Oh, that's good. I which is, here. it's almost like watching a movie. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, uh, i got to tell you, Fallout 3 is, is just amazing, because it's, if you've played Fallout 1 and Fallout 2... You have the um, the uh, the same sort of interface, but in those ones it was basically a point and click adventure. You you know it like in the tradition of uh, King's Quest or Space Quest, where you walk onto a screen and then you click around on things. This is mm -hmm. this exact same thing except it's first person perspective, or third person. You can go third person if you want, but first person. So you're like looking out at this vast wasteland. And you can walk in any direction you want, and there's stuff to do. You get into quests. Wow. It's like um, it's like what I imagine uh, World of Warcraft is like, except actually fun. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, like the quests are not like, uh, hey, let's go kill something. The quests are like, uh, uh, there's somebody over there. Maybe they'll talk to me. Maybe they won't. Because the, somebody mm -hmm. wrote the stories. Like, there's tons of stories, and uh, you just get into interactions and you don't know where they're going to go you don't know what's going to happen there's mysteries around every corner and uh you get all the the cool um perks that you have in the older games oh man it's so cool great yeah super addictive i recommend you not start doing it if you don't want to lose your job and family <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to divorce don't get this game <laughs> <laughs> oh they should put that on the cover uh, <laughs> no, because then they'll lose sales. This has been the SFF Audio Podcast. Please join us at www.sffaudio.com. <laughs>